given to me by Woody Shaw, Sunship, Dizzy, and Billy Higgins, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my jazz heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome, everybody, inside the Blackwood Broadcasting Studios at an undisclosed institute of higher learning. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're happy to have all of you along with us today. My guest today is from New Orleans, Louisiana, a territory the United States acquired from the French in the Louisiana Purchase because the French had lost control of the African slaves who came to Congo Square to communicate through the drum. The drum could talk in a universal language of spirit, mind, and body, and in that order. This is the Bayou culture a mighty codifio hoodoo approach to singing and songwriting built from tales of the Walcott Medicine Show mixed with snake poison and transformational characters. The chanting, the voodoo, all very misunderstood and therefore feared by Western man. Build the body of the car and strip it of its soul. If it don't look pretty, then there must be nothing there. My guest today came into music when individuality was king. He comes from the land of gumbo in the garb of the indigenous. His smoky Gulf Coast honky-tonk toe-tapping style started in the southeast before being catapulted west and let Hollywood be thy name. However, sunny California proved to be a gateway towards meeting more individuals seeking warm sound, solidarity, and a way to keep the sun roots and herbs inside the music. Guys like Levon Helm and Maria Muldaur. Van Morrison, Paul Butterfield, Sonny and Cher, and Frank Zappa. Before that, it was Bobby Charles and Alan Toussaint and the Meters and Professor Longhair and on and on and on and on. Still hot as ever, striding on the acoustic with a Hammond behind him in a brass section in the right place, playing to houses big and small, carrying the traditions of regional swamp music, Malcolm John Michael Crow Rebinac. Welcome to The Jake Feinberg Show. How are you, my man? Hey, I'm breathing, and it's important. You know, it's very important. I wanted, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, in this day and age, you talk about the idea of machinery uh, getting in the way of spirituality, uh, and I wanted you, especially for my generation and younger generations, to talk about the medicine shows that you used to go to and Prince, I want to, I want to pronounce it the right way, Prince Layla and the, um, the kinds of experiences you had there that made you believe in the power of the spirit. Well, if, if it don't be for the spirit kingdom, the meat world don't exist. You know, that's the first thing I, 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 I was, I was given that information to to roll with. You know, it, without the breath of life, we don't we don't exist. And uh, and uh, oh yeah, who, who who spreads the the winds is the breath of life, and that's very important. Could you describe what a medicine show looked like? Because, because oh, I remember seeing like the rabbit foot ministers. My my grandfather had worked in uh, Al C. Fields ministry shows, and so I was around a lot of people that had uh, uh, worked on those kind of gigs. My grandfather was uh, a little bit crippled up because of having. Uh, 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 some accident happened to him doing these things, but uh, back 
and in, in some ways it was more prodigious, but in some other ways it was uh, 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 we didn't uh, ex- expect to misuse uh, 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 the very planet we live on, which I like to call Grandmother Earth, uh, and misuse her so bad. It's ironic that we're talking today on uh, as um, you know as the court battle begins between the Justice Department and BP Oil, um, and uh, it seems like the thing that comes out of it is the amount of money that's on the table. But yet, like I said in my intro, it, Dr. John, you know the idea of you know it seems like in our country the body of the car is very sleek and very beautiful, but they, uh, the soul has been removed. The soul has been taken away from grandmother earth. And my question is that's, is that soul still there? Is it just being tamped down? Is it being held down or has it, you know, where are we at spiritually in this country? Well, we're in, we're in it really, I mean, listen, we are removed grandmother if we remove all the uh, oil from, from her and when it causes her to hemorrhage as she did in the, in the Gulf of Mexico this is not a good science and uh, the kind of experiments that are being done today uh, you know uh, are pretty ridiculous uh, this, but this is what has happened for long, long periods of time. This isn't something new. You know. It's just a follow-up to where things had gotten to. I mean, let's face it. If Henry Ford, Thomas L. Edison had figured out how to make cause it worked with batteries and all of these things in the 1800s. Uh, and then the most torch proof building in the United States, which was Thomas Alva Edison's uh, 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 laboratories, uh, was torched. And uh, that's a very strange thing. It did, you know, maybe something to do with the oil companies had something to do with this. Who knows? Mm -hmm. All I know is that the things that happened that were like, uh, uh, I I happen to to have known something about, well, these were things that were like really uh, uh, not necessarily things you know you um you know it's just it's it's we're talking to dr john and um you know i i, I just this am i pronouncing it correctly this prince lala yes can you talk about um that per the well, he was my second guitar teacher's brother and he was uh, learning how to play the guitar when i was studying from papoose uh, his brother and uh, this was a long time ago before I started studying guitar lessons from a guy named Roy Mantra. And, um, but uh, I was very blessed all the way through to have studied with uh, A.J. Goomer at World Lines Music, studying guitar. But uh, it was very strange to have guitar lessons at Papoose's pad when his sister, uh, uh, steel chest would come to the gate uh, with uh, uh, a straight razor in her bra. And uh, so what do you want here? And this would be every day. And uh, it was very strange thing to, to, to do. And uh, I, I told somebody whether it was Papoose or his father or his brother or somebody would let me in. I'd be standing there with my guitar case not wanting to talk to her. 
you know. But it was a, a, a different time and a different point, you know. But the, the times had their shortcomings in that way as then, but it's gotten worse the way I look at it now. You yeah, know, I want you to talk to me. You said it before. You said in some ways at that time it was more prejudice, but in some ways it, things made more sense. And now, yeah. and so talk, can you talk about how, even though it might have been more overtly prejudice, actually there was more camaraderie? Or, or you know, why don't you expand yeah, on that? Listen, I had, I had no problems from papooses for anybody in that family. You know, I mean, uh, one of his sisters, Baby, is married to my old, my old business partner, uh, Jesse Hill. And um, it, it, it's all very close knit. Uh, uh, all of us were very close. And that's uh, the way the two sides of it was like. Either people were real tight or they were real distant. Mm -hmm. I look at it all today with a feeling like in some ways it was a lot better before integration. Because that's when the police used to come up and when I was studying with my third guitar teacher or my job and Chase Reed, I would be subbing for him on the, on the gigs. While well, he would be going to take care of some business for us. And uh, I would just go sit in with, with a, uh, some of his old partners and, and uh, it was never... A, a bad thing until uh, we, we we became integrated. And it's very strange to me how a word integration could be so far turned into something negative, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, in this city, I'm not the only one that felt a lot of that, you know. And, um, you know, New Orleans got, because of it being below the cotton curtain, got stuck in a lot of crossfire. You, you actually were responsible for putting together the the first black artist cooperative all for one and um you were the only white member of the of the organization but well actually in uh, in uh, 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 I had nothing basically to do with it Melvin Lasty really was the guy behind that and uh, he was trying but he was also connected with the spiritual church of New Orleans and was very much a, 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 a very powerful part of that and uh he tried in so many ways to give people awareness of a lot of things. Of course, he, when he became the union representative before 96, which this was prior to when the, the two unions were integrated, it was 174 was the white union and 496 was the black union. When they were integrated, it's not as good as, in some ways, as when it was two unions, but there were still problems then, too. 
but uh, a lot of the people that we were dealing with in some ways then, or what later it became different kinds of problems, but it, this was typical. I mean, when you look at so many of the things that happened, it, it just doesn't quite end. You know, I've always been, I've talked to a lot of the jazzers, and I know your your father owned an appliance shop and a record shop, and uh, you you know, some of your early leanings were towards Satchmo and, and Dizzy and Charlie Parker. And, but I also, I've heard from some of the, the artists that I've talked to, the, um, the black unions, when they were not integrated, the, the black unions actually held pretty, they were pretty strong. And they... Um, advocated for their own people. And I'm curious as to uh, your view of the, of the unions uh, when they, before integration and if it was actually more, if it allowed more flexibility and fluidity and um, within, within the music itself. Well, these, the unions that were right here in the wall, that was very different than the basic structure of unions in, in general. I have to say this, uh, that they were a lot more. Uh, they didn't, uh, we didn't get paid for sessions where we had no knowledge of a guy called a contractor. Mm -hmm. We had no knowledge of any of these kind of things, the arrangers, you had to hustle for any money they got paid for arranging a session. And this was not, this, these were the bad sides. The good sides was that there was more flexibility toward helping racially, uh, 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 you know, lives that were out there, you know, <laughs> that people could understand them pretty easy. You know, let's, I started doing sessions when 2250 was the scale for recording sessions. And uh, this was a long time ago. <laughs> no, but that's, yeah, the, exactly. But that, that's the part of m the goal of my show is to explore, um, you know, where how far we have gone uh, or how, how far we have drifted from things that made sense, maybe things that as a society we say we've evolved, but we really haven't evolved. And like you said, we've, we, we've made all these discoveries hundreds of years ago. And it seems like our problems are easily, I guess the thing that concerns me the most as a 34 year old father of two is just the idea that the, the, the solutions to our problems or quote unquote problems seem to be easily solvable. But there's a segment of our population that doesn't really want to solve them. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then the future is, uh, it could be very dangerous as opposed to, and I think it just speaks to one thing, and I think it speaks to leadership. And in many ways, um, it was very hard to marginalize Mac Rebenack, Booker T. Jones, Lee Von Helm, uh, Donald Duck Dunn, B.B. King. Alan Toussaint, the meters, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to uh, pigeonhole that? How are you supposed to soundbite that? You can't marginalize that. That's love. And, and, but, and but, Butterfield as well. I look at, I look at some of the guys that just even amongst some of the guys you talk about, but I also think about people like, uh, a Huey Piano Smith who taught me how to write songs. This was a, 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 a change in my life. And Huey gets no money for all of the hit songs he wrote down. All of the songs that were hits with Huey Smith and the Clowns, Huey collects no money now. And I look at the, all of the the people, whether it was the Professor Long has, I mean, the most proudest record I ever produced was, in, uh, even I'll get to play on Big Chief, but it was Mardi Gras in New Orleans because it was a year, every year up until Big Chief came out. And uh, all of these kind of songs were very instrumental 
working now on changing some things. And, uh, I mean, it, it was, I think, all of these things had something to do with, like, say, uh, Big Chief Tutti Montana changing the way that the Mardi Gras Indians, it changed, uh, shifted gears with, within themselves. And uh, he started the thing about, hey, we don't need to be out there killing each other. And, uh, because this was a pretty common trait early on. The Indians would take somebody off the count in Georgia second. And uh, it was not uh, in Tootie Bullet Coattail. Well, look, we can't do this. Well, each one of those guys that did something like that, or Earl King, that he also helped me as a songwriter. All of these kind of people that were like in around my life and doing sessions with me, and I mean, I would I would say I worked uh, uh, more recording sessions with Huey Smith than I did with Alan Toussaint. Mm. Even I worked a lot of recording sessions with Alan Toussaint. Mm-hmm. But uh, back in the game. Uh, it was like uh, uh, Huey was recording for a guy named Johnny Vincent out of Jackson, Mississippi that took his, and put his name on Huey's songs. And this was not easy for Huey to get his copyrights back and he still hasn't done so. But these are the kind of little things that is not little to Huey Smith. You know, Al at least collects his, his, his royalties in some degree. It was a, that's a, a much more better situation. But it's so much confusement along the way. Yeah, I, I, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to agree. I, you know, um, Dr. John, I just wanted to uh, take a moment here and, and uh, play a track of music. Not sure the last time you heard it, but, uh, you know, let's, uh, we'll come back and put it in its place after, okay? Didn't they know? 
good behind me Some old crawfish head Right, Dr. John, tell me what loop guru means. Well, it's like a, a werewolf. Really? It's like a swamp werewolf. A swamp. So something that you would see in the swamps of in 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 Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, from 1970, and. I'm just that band was that the ba- it's hard for me I have the I have the LP and um there's no listing of the accompanists and I I I really wanted to take this time was this the band with uh, Didymus Crooks and Johnson who who was actually no uh uh, uh that was uh, uh, a band from actually they were from uh I was in the days uh, I used to do these. Uh, uh, I was like Atlantic Records guy that was like a tax man that would uh, buy the bands and all. But these were some guys from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And, uh, 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 I just, uh, I can't remember all of the guys that was in that band. Uh, I I can think. I think that the bass player was named Hog. Hog. Yeah, and I think they had played later on, like some uh, some group, uh, some big like uh, British groups uh, hits. I can't think of who. Uh, Doctor John, I, don't worry about it. I want you to tell me about like Loop Guru when you. How do you put a song like that in your mind together? Is it is it the way the animal's walking, the way it's striding? The, and how do you get all the guys on that album? I guess the question I have is, they all had to know what that was too. I mean, it was part of a, it was part of regionalism. And I just wanted you to talk about how that. Uh, and actually, around that part of Louisiana, it's not as prevalent uh, as as it is deep south Louisiana. Mm. That was something that was, and people used to talk about the loop guru, and it was very a common thing to hear people talk. And it was like I remember when uh, my grandmother, uh, when I was a kid, she would uh, 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 would tell me stories about stuff like that, you know, and uh, when she would. Uh, tell me these stories that would be like, uh, wow. Uh, uh, she would keep us all up like, uh, and it, it, she would she would purposefully, I think, uh, uh, um, I think she did a thing, it was uh, called uh, uh, maybe um <clears throat> Uh, tell you like horror stories before you went to sleep. That's great. That's just exactly what you need is nightmares before bed, right? <laughs> well, she had a way of doing it that was real special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, right. And uh, she could do that with really a powerful way of doing it, you know? And uh, it was just way cool. Uh, but she would tell you stories about the uh, the gown man and uh, the the loop guru and all of these kind of stories and uh, it would she would tell you it took out oh the needle man and that was one that used to scare me and she would tell me about this guy that would stick kids with needles and it would be like uh, uh, his zombies from nailing out. And it was like weird, you know. Oh yeah, it sounds great. 
But now my grandma really knew how to tell a story that was like hit you home. But later, you know, I, I used to go out hunting with my pa and all of that. And, you know, back in the game, people live very seasonally. That's one of the better things about the way this planet was. People didn't grow things that were out of season. And have that for like a pride, a prideful thing to talk about. Uh, no, they just they they live very seasonally, and like in, during the winter months, you you trap game and you you hunt a game, and during the summer months, you caught fish. That was a very normal way to live. And I think that was a much healthier way to live because when you live seasonally, then uh, you're part of the uh, grandmother Earth's plan. You know, I, I think one of the uh, first things that came up, and uh, people take them very for granted today, but uh, and uh, it was it, like that. Uh, Freezer chest. Mm -hmm. And when they were invented, all of a sudden everybody put something in their freezer. Well, back in the game, they had ice boxes. And if somebody had to deliver ice to put in your ice box, and it held stuff for today, maybe tomorrow. But it wasn't going to last too long. So you had to cook it and eat it. And that was something a little closer to what nature is about. You, you follow where I'm coming from? I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm totally loving it. And, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the opportunity in the South, especially <clears throat> for cats to go to the the rivers and the streams and the brooks and have space and to write and to sing about the imagery that they saw. And those, a lot of that has become a concrete jungle now. You see a lot of... Mm -hmm. you, a lot, yeah, a lot. There's, there's things all around where I'm at that was not like this in the past. One of the things, uh, it's like, uh, it's really sad to, to, to see how much things, because there's so many people on the planet today, that people they just keep building stuff, and just what you said, put concrete chives up. And just like there was no street signs in the jungles, in the swamps, we went back in the game. Uh, people were losing sight of how to read the street signs on the, on the, on the streets that they have today. Yeah, it's almost like uh, uh, there's a, I think you brought up something interesting. You know, there's an excess of information out there, but also because of that, um, uh, a lack of appreciation for what, like you said, seasonally things used to grow uh, seasonally, and, and people we just expect to have everything now uh, at our disposal. Um, you know, there there isn't necessarily. Uh, I guess my question also is is that you you went from before we uh, move on the how would you dis when I listen to Loop Guru just as an example, you know I've interviewed guys from uh nashville and i've interviewed uh guys from the west coast and you obviously went out to the west coast but if you could talk to my audience about the regionalism of bayou music and what it what it what what it meant to you and and what it still means to you today what is that sound well you know listen there's so many forms of sounds it's whether it's the second line that's the New Orleans thing, whether it's the whether it's the 
the Cajun music. Well, it's the Creole music. And uh, it, I have a lot of love for a lot of the Creole music that came out when uh, I used to hear guys like Danny Barker singing a Creole songs with all of the old timers, you know. And I mean, I mean, guys that were like known back in the game and uh, Danny got to work with all these guys but Danny was a special guy all into himself that he brought so many of the New Orleans artists to to New York and to up into uh, you know into different areas that they it was like uh there was a guy, a old friend of mine, and Cousin Joe. And I thought Cuz was one of the great writers of New Orleans. Like, all the bebop bands used to take him to, to, to sing with them when they needed a blues singer to make the gig. When they had a big book, like a, you know, a, sure. a, a blues gig. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but Cuz was one of them real hip guys, when he would sing the blues, he was like way old school. And, uh, but it was like he was in, he had a way of writing songs that was way like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, he wrote, he wrote a song like Art Blake, he wanted to finish his record with this song. And it, it was, uh, uh, uh Think of it. Uh, uh, it's the last line of the song, and Art Blakey happened to sing it on his last recording, and uh, it was still, uh, saying that uh, 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 I never seen a armored car follow a funeral yet. Mm. Well, that was a great line, and it was a cousin Joe line, and. Uh, and it was like uh, from back in the game. And Cuz wrote a lot of songs in the 40s that were really classics. And uh, But that was one of the songs. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the song, but it was... Uh, uh, it was his last recording he did? This was Art Blakey's last recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, this is fascinating stuff, but but we we we, we'll, we can go into it. I I don't want to, you know. It's it, the the. Um, I can take you inside tracks. Excuse me. Do that, Jake. No, you know. I just it, the other thing. Uh, like, do you spend time? Uh, at you you play so many shows. I, uh, a buddy of mine was just down in. Uh, New Orleans for New Year's, and he saw your band down there, and he said it was blazing. But I, do you spend time uh, sometimes talking to the audiences about the meanings of some of the songs and sort of the history of it? Because, uh, like Loop Guru, I never would have now. Now I know with crawfish heads being ripped off, you know, it's a it's a it's a werewolf, you know, it's a it's a swamp wolf. But I don't, I would never have known that otherwise. So do you, do you ever do you ever talk about it with your audiences? Sometimes, I, if I'm in a mood to judge, I go do that. But sometimes, I don't. It just depends what kind of head I'm in. You know, it's a... <coughs> I'm very uh, loose with all of that. And, and, you know, one of the things that I feel blessed is that the old times I always schooled me. And I, whether it was a guy like Cousin Joe taught me not only how to dress, but he told me, you know, he'd say, hey, you can't wear that. Your feathers don't match. And he always said, your feathers don't match. Not you, your vines don't match or whatever. You know, he mm-hmm. would say that. And it would crack me up because you know, he was just a character of the old school. But he told me, um, Danny, 
Borg brought him and Mr. Google Eyes up to and uh, uh, up to uh, uh, New York and New Jersey, and they recorded for a lot of the labels that was up there and did a lot of things for that. But uh, uh, I think the fact, no, but the point is that you were making is that it really didn't matter. That 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 the feathers were out of were not matching. It didn't matter. Well, it it when I learned from cousin Joe, because all the pimps used to go copy the way he dressed, and you don't see pimps usually uh, uh, check it out. <laughs> uh, a guy that's not a pimp, right? <laughs> but his shoes would match. But after he passed away. And uh, we were real close because of Google Eyes, too, was my close friend. And uh, Cousin Joe was a very humble guy. He would say, yeah, I wrote this song, but Google Eyes sang. And it was true. I mean, Google Eyes really could work a house when he'd do it. I used to have him come up and be my MC and sing something before I would come on the stage and sometimes during my gigs, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's when you, when you type with people and you know what I mean? It's just, it's, you feel a, a closeness with people to, to where you, you want to do little things from, them, you know, it's like, uh, important. No, and I, I, uh, I just want to, you know, there's, I agree with you uh, uh, very much. And in some ways, uh, the next track where music we're going to play is uh, is kind of the way I feel talking to Dr. John right now. So, um, you know, you were a prolific uh, studio musician as well for quite some time. And I uh, just wanted to play this track and come back and talk about it. <laughs> pictures in my mind Oh, what a good day to go fishing And catch the sunset in the hills And dream of my yesterdays and tomorrow That you be with me still Saw a butterfly And named it after you Your name has such a pleasant sound Dream of my 
yesterdays and tomorrows And hope that you'll be with me still I saw a butterfly and I named it after you Your name has such a pleasant sound Must be in a good place now I must be in a good place now Well, I'm definitely in a good place now with Dr. John. Thank you, my man, for that. That was you on piano. Well, I, you know what? It, it was it's funny to me because the last time I recorded that song, it was Bobby was helping me produce a record right before he passed with uh, uh, Shannon McNally singing. That's right. All of his songs. And that's getting ready to come out. So. I, I just was, it was amazing to me because you got to let me <clears throat> tell you the story is that I found this album, Bobby Charles on Bearsville. And there's all these guys on it. I mean, and, you know, Richard Manuel's on it and, you know, Mac Rebinax on it. And I mean, there's several different key. They don't, t- they don't tell you what, what songs you play piano on. And when I listened to that solo, I said, boy, you know, I mean, that sounds like Richard Manuel a little bit, you know? And, and, and I mean, I play that, I think. With Shannon McNally, I could be wrong, but, you know, she had a, a little child around that time, and it's so beautiful. I have a little baby at home, and we just danced to that song. It's such a beautiful song. And then I'm doing some research on the internet last night before the interview, and it turns out you're the one playing piano on it. And I said, you know, that is beautiful. That is, you don't hear that on alternative country stations. And that's the kind of music that is just, you can just, you know, Bobby's on the on the cover with a dog. He a dog is kissing him, and he's eating a watermelon. I mean, I love it. I just love it, man. It's just beautiful. You know, the, uh, Bobby uh, was one of my hero partners. Just like uh, Doc Palmer, and they both passed away. Doc and and Bobby was on the phone one day. Doc bed, and I'm writing them songs with Doc, but at the point was that. They started talking about writing songs about stuff that people don't want to talk about. Right. And I'll always have that to remember from them. I told Sharon Palmer's about it, and I told Bobby's kids about this, that that was a big thing in my life. And we wrote some songs in that area. You know, but uh, th- th- these are the kind of things that meant a lot to me because, I mean, uh, when I cut a, a, a record called Tribal, before I cut this last record, that uh, on a, uh, on a lockdown, that, that record had a lot of Bobby in it. And a lot of songs that we wrote together, but they, I have found the oldest song me I could find that me and Bobby wrote that I could remember. Mm. And I put it on that record, and it's called Partners. And I, it was it cracks me up when I, I look at it. And he says, "Your dancing part, no, I see your dancing part. I might be the one that brought you, but your hanging part, I might be the one that hung you." Mm. And, and but there's a line in it that's so obvious in with friends like that who needs enemies. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's that's. I mean, and it's just it's when I listen to that, I could hear listen to that song all the time, and I I, I hear the sincerity in it. He also does a song, uh, you know, about uh, the the opening track on that album is about uh, living with the street people, loving street people. Yeah. You know, and, and that, to me, um, 
with all the sort of sensationalism and the whatever the values the values that's a that's a big issue and and, and your values and Bobby's values and um, you know it it clearly it clearly resonated with 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 it resonates with me that's what I can say you know and and from the RCO All Stars and from Alan, all the people that you have been around, um, you know, and, and collaborated with, uh, you've seen it all and you're still doing it. I mean, you just did this album with the black keys and, you know, I just, you, you t- tell me, tell me there's still that Bobby Charles, Levon Helm spirit out there. <clears throat> well, you know what? Uh, I think that all of those, Levon was a, I knew him since way back in the game when uh, him and, uh, when he, he used to work with uh, the guy out of uh, uh, Ronnie Hawkins. Yeah, Ronnie Hawkins, and uh, they would we would be getting to a gig somewhere up in maybe North Louisiana, and they would be doing a gig coming from Arkansas, and uh, it would be like. They would always take off and leave on. Always was driving Ronnie's vehicle, <laughs> and uh, 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 it would be like they would lay, he would lay rubber, and all of a sudden all his rocks would be flying and stuff. <laughs> and uh, we was in a car that was barely making it to the gig, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, it's like, uh, ah, man, uh, and. Uh, it was just funny days still, but you know what? I remember leave on from those days, and uh, I didn't know that uh, 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 Bobby Charles had invited me up to Woodstock, and uh, and uh, I, that's why I, I got to meet these guys. You know. Yeah, I was going to ask you. So, so. Bobby Bobby went up there to, to cut an album and uh, for Bearsville and then he said I want Mac I want you to come up the, you you had not been there before No I hadn't I hadn't been up to Woodstock before that Talk if, if, to the best you can I mean you got pretty uh you, you did that album and you know there were all the you know, Amos Garrett was there and Levon Rick Danko Richard Manuel, um, what, what was that experience like uh, for you? What did you love about those guys? What did you love about the the scene up there? I, you know, I remember when Joe Glazer was handling us, mm-hmm. and he told us, he says, uh, uh, we were supposed to be on a Woodstock gig, and it, it, uh, the check was no good. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he said, just, don't worry about it. He says, you just drive on to the next gig in, uh, and I think it was in Toronto. And uh, I had put a Toronto Pop Festival or something on a blues festival, whatever festival it was. I don't remember any of that. But it, the kicks was, to me, was leave one and them, all of them guys was on a gig up there. And it just was like, Wow, they sound good, but there was a lot of distractions. I mean, we had like some like, tiny Tim in the dressing room uh, serenading us with a a ukulele, <laughs> and it was not my favorite instrument. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and uh, I always told my brother. I mean, I used to tell him all the time when. I said, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, harmonicas is not one of my favorite instruments. I, I, when I, I don't like an accordion. I don't like an, uh, a harmonica. So I like very few harmonica players. I played on some of the old Sonny Bob Williamson sessions. And I, it, it, this wasn't the guy that became famous as Sonny Bob Williamson. Mm-hmm. But this other this other guy became, but he had had a thing and started uh, 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 a lot of things. But in all those times, these were special people in my spirit. You know what I mean? Uh, they always, they, we would always communicate. 
there would be some good things. I, I remember going up and doing one of uh, 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 Lee Vaughan's things that was, uh, he called them the Midnight Rambles up in, up in Woodstock. Sure. And, and uh, he got that name from me because we used to play the Midnight Ramble would be uh, uh, at a stripper joint. We used to play at the Blue Cat where there would be like uh, the Midnight Ramble was would draw sailors from all over the world. And they would just all know to go to that show. And it was something that they wouldn't see anywhere else with strippers, you know? Oh, I, I mean, I, I, that's, this is a great, this is an amazing story. <laughs> Continue, please. Well, anyway, the, 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 it was really off the hook. I, guess, uh, I mean, uh, the show ended with a, a, a girl bowling a, 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 a donkey that was painted up to look like a zebra. <laughs> and I mean, uh, this is uh, kind of, you know, you don't get to see this kind of thing every day. And uh, But these uh, sailors loved that. You know, it, it was something really, wow. <laughs> well, after, I mean, after being cooped up with a bunch of guys for a long time on a ship, you know, to come back and, yeah. and see that, it's pretty pretty wild. And uh, when I was, uh, <laughs> these were all strippers that was too old to work on Bourbon Street, but they, <laughs> they could work uh, there. Right. Okay. So this was in uh, this was in New Orleans and and Levon and and. I'm, but I told him about the the, the gigs and then he just used that. <laughs> and I said, man, listen, what is it? Man, it's just some words, you know. And you can't copyright words. <laughs> it's true. I mean, but so he used the Midnight Ramble came from those from those stories of of you playing at those because I've I've talk to guys in San Francisco and maybe you know you'd have you'd have you know jazz players playing 20 minute tracks while the you know the strippers were, were gyrating but yet now you're talking about you know you know Dr. John in a strip club as well this is wild and and, and actually it's a perfect place to see music because I, I wanted a place to start working in joints was I learned this was my first time I ever learned to do Gellington songs Mm-hmm. A lot of strippers started their shows with a ballad that was one of the girls and songs. And when I made this record, I called it Duke Gallican. But that's what one of my old partners who was always called Duke. He called, he never called him Duke Gallican. He called him Duke Gallican. And he also called, uh, 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 Fat Wallace, uh, uh, the Fat Wallace. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, but that was one of my old partners that used to do that, and that's a little off the hook, but you know, he was a good guy. But all of those guys from back then was special to my spirit, you know? It's like I still see some of them guys today, you know? And it's like when I see them, they still alive and breathing. It means a world to me. Talk about t who who do you still who do you see that when you see it just it, you start to feel that spirit and, and and all that energy inside of you. Um, I told Bobby about this guy. They call him Old Man. Everybody calls him Old Man, and he was an old guy when when we were youngsters. He's still alive. And I said, I asked him one day, I said, now that, now that you retired and everything, uh, 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 what do you do for, uh, you know, for your life? And he says, well, I go to the pool hall and I, all these kids think they're going to take my money. I take their money and I go fishing. <laughs> I said, that sounds like a good way to, to be in retirement. You know, people like him uh, is an inspiration to me, you know. But he gave me a song and uh, years ago, and uh, 
I, I try to get Bobby to help me with it. And uh, oh old man to say, I played him at the mall, man. And he said, uh, hey, you got to play punk. Man, I don't want to hear that, that, that message. I don't want to hear some punk. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, what you gave me, that's what I came up with. And, but he'd always, every time I made a demo and I had Bobby helping me with that song, and said, not enough punk. And I, so I, I don't know where he's at now, but if I could find him, I would, I would, I would see, see if you like the new version of it, you know. <laughs> no, I really think it's this. Um, I, I, I'm actually just, I'm still kind of floored that I've, of course, founded this. The when Shannon McNally she approached you and said, "I, you know, it, it's Bobby's coming up on his seventy fifth birthday, and I want to." Well, what what happened was uh, uh, I told Shannon that uh, she was the only one when Bobby wouldn't show up with his jazz fest gigs in the wall, and uh, and they they were whole, they put a whole string of people together. And I told her, I said, well, you the one that sings Bobby's songs with the most intense. And uh, I think you could, you should do a, a record of just doing so much stuff Bobby does. And, and uh, Bobby got talking to her, and, and, and we did the record. And when I was doing a record for a city care for that. And uh, that was... Uh, Whatever year that was, I don't even remember that. But it doesn't matter. My my mind kind of all melted into a Salvador Dali thing. <laughs> in some ways, you know. Well, we're gonna cue up one more piece of music because what comes around goes around. Let's hit it. Off uh, 1974, Desitively Bonnaroo. And uh, Dr. John, I wanted to ask you about Leo and George Porter and the Neville brothers and and how you guys worked, so, why you guys worked so well together and what those guys meant to your career personally. Well, you know, I had, I had wrote songs for O.T. Neville. I had 
been working with him for a lot of years. And uh, I, I ran with Charles Neville back in the game. So, I mean, this was like guys I was real tight with and close to, you know. So, I mean, it was like a very natural. And, I mean, I knew Aaron back in the game. And, I, I mean, he used to, uh, uh, I used to run with him a little bit, but uh, mostly with uh, uh, Charles. And, uh, but I, I knew all of them guys, uh, you know. I didn't know Cyril, really. He was the youngest one, you know. But uh, I remember them really good, you know. But I did with my partners. Absolutely. No, and, and you know. All the rest of the guys in the meters that was, was all, you know. I remember when I, I actually uh, first heard them guys. They was in, uh, uh, doing a session in the wall. And, uh, uh. Uh, uh, I think they had had a record out before that, but they was doing one of their records, early records. And, uh, but they was uh, in the studio cutting at Cosmos when it had moved to Corondo Wood Street, I think, or Barone Street. I can't remember that. But it wasn't there very long. That's when I worked at Cosmos Studio. We usually on Governor Nicholas. But prior to that, it had been over there where I first heard a recording session with my father, who was pretty close with guys. That, uh, it was uh, on Domain and Rampart. That was the original Cosmos. It was behind the shoe shine, Paul. Did did uh did I'm just curious who did Two Saint bring the meters to be a, the rhythm section for you? How did how did you guys link up? Well, we were working some gigs on the road after a right place record came out, right? And uh, uh, uh and uh, we also would be playing. As uh, two bands, when we were uh, doing like the the, the the original Mardi Gras Mambo, was it uh, out at uh, in uh, Chalmet? And, boy, it was a long time. Yeah, ago. no, I mean that's that's my show, man. I, I'm I'm pulling you back deep, and and uh, Doctor John, I just want to before we wrap things up, I just wanted to do um, ask you one final question. Um, you were part of uh, an iconic concert called The Last Waltz that was uh, put on by Martin Scorsese and involved, uh, you know, guys like Neil Diamond, Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, um, and the band. And looking back on it, what did, did that, did that, the, the closing of The Winterland and The Last Waltz, did that signal the end of an era in your mind? Or looking back on that, how do you feel about that that show and and uh, and what it meant? Well, I just I remember a couple of things about that gig a lot. Uh, I remember I sang a song with Bobby Charles that wasn't in it, and I remember uh, everybody. Uh, 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 I, I thought that, uh, like Van Morrison should have did that. Uh, they should have did, I think it was Tura Lura Lura or something. That was a song he did mm -hmm. on that gig. And everybody did a little more than that. But I also remember Robbie wanted me to bring the uh, girl singers. And then he had to dub in some footage with some the staple singers and Emmy Lou Harris and all of that. That wasn't did at that gig, you know. He he didn't want you to bring the singers. No. Yeah, it was. I remember reading uh, where Levon said that he didn't want. Uh, 
Oh boy, I'm I'm blanking on his name, but uh, uh, the blues singer uh, he didn't uh, he didn't want uh, any of those guys there either. And, and Levon basically said, if you don't let him sing, I'm not going to play. But you know, so they had to overdub what that. Is it Muddy Waters. Muddy, yeah, th- geez, yeah, it's been an, my brain's done too. Yeah, Muddy Waters. Mu- yeah, exactly. Levon. Well, uh, I tell you one thing that I remember about Muddy. And, and playing at, at uh, the rehearsal for that, and they should have filmed it. Uh, well, but who would have guessed that uh, all these guitar players that was there had their jaws hanging open? <laughs> Marty played a guitar solo, but he played nine below zero, and she had the nerve to put me out. And uh, that song just resonated. With everything, I was blew away just hearing. I bet I was on a road, you know. It was Joe Glazer was booking him back then, and uh, it was a, it was a, a spiritual thing, you know. When 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 can when can you come to Tucson to play for for us? Hey, listen, I would be glad to do it when when I get a gig there. <laughs> <laughs> well we'll try to make that happen dr john and, <laughs> and i gotta tell you man it is you know um, hey by the way i just wanted to tell you just in case of my employee your coach here that whenever you say the name of sugar boy song it's jackal jack yes i we have that loud and clear we're never going to say the other name Yes, good because uh, the wrong people gets the money. Then. <laughs> exactly. No, we want and we want it to we want it to go into the right hands, and we want grandmother yeah. we, and we want grandmother Earth to be taken care of too, Mac yes. Mac Revenac. So vital, that's vital. If we take care of grandmother Earth, and you have a blessed day. You take care, my friend. It was great all to talk right. to you. All right. It was very nice speaking with you, Jay. You got it, brother. All right, we'll talk soon. Right. Bye bye. Right. It's the Jake Feinberg Show, and we'll see you all in a little bit. Hey.